AWS, Google Cloud Platform, Azure, and many other cloud providers all offer a managed Kubernetes service. This is a great option if you need a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud, and it is very easy to get started. For example, in the Amazon Web Services console, you can set up a production-ready cluster with just a few clicks, and you don't even have to worry about tasks like maintenance or upgrades. This is all done for you by the cloud provider. But despite all of these advantages, there are scenarios where you'll find that you need to run a self-managed cluster in the cloud. And that is what we want to take a look at today. How can we deploy a self-managed Kubernetes cluster in a cloud provider like AWS? And of course, why would we even want to do that in the first place? So for many reasons, some organizations decide against using a managed Kubernetes, and this is even with them already hosting some of their infrastructure in the cloud. And a big reason for this is the need to avoid vendor locking. Such an organization may host its infrastructure across multiple cloud providers, with some of its infrastructure also being on-premise. So they opt to use a Kubernetes distribution that can run anywhere and not only a vendor-specific distribution. And having this flexibility means you can move around your infrastructure and even your deployed applications as you like. It also helps you have identical cluster setups everywhere. You expect the same behavior each time you deploy an application to a cluster regardless of where it is running. So this uniformity is also very helpful when it comes to things like debugging issues. And of course, not to mention other good reasons like cost optimization. So you have decided to deploy a self-managed Kubernetes cluster in the cloud. Let us look at an example setup on how we might go about doing this. We'll deploy a K3S cluster in AWS. And of course, you're going to need an AWS account if you want to reproduce these steps in your own environment. Read about how to install the AWS CLI on your machine. The AWS CLI is a tool that you can use to manage your AWS services. You can follow these instructions and configure the AWS CLI credentials. Once your AWS credentials are properly configured in your terminal, they can be used by Terraform, which is another tool you're going to need to have on your machine for this tutorial. Terraform is an infrastructure as code tool that we will use to deploy the required infrastructure to AWS. So make sure you install Terraform as well on your machine. Now, let us take a look at the infrastructure that we're going to set up today in the AWS cloud. So everything that we deploy today will be created inside of a single VPC. Now, an Amazon Virtual Private Cloud is a service provided by Amazon Web Services. This allows users to create a logically isolated section of the AWS cloud. So this can help us, for example, in our scenario to separate our self-managed Kubernetes cluster from any other infrastructure that we may already be running in AWS. Our cluster will be a highly available cluster. This means we will deploy a control plane in two availability zones for redundancy in case one of these zones experiences an outage. An availability zone is also an isolated location within a specific AWS region, like you see here with EU Central 1A and EU Central 1B. An availability zone is designed to be fault tolerant with independent power, networking and cooling. Each zone will have its own subnet, so any control plane or worker nodes in either zone will run in separate subnets. Each subnet will also have its own public routing table. An AWS route table is a set of rules or routes that determine where network traffic is directed within the VPC. So in order to grant internet access to the nodes in both zones, we create a public routing table and create a default route pointing to an internet gateway. An internet gateway in AWS is a VPC component that enables communication between resources in your VPC and the internet. And it serves two main purposes, enabling outbound internet access for resources in public subnets and allowing inbound access to those resources from the internet. For external communication with the control plane, we will deploy an internet facing network load balancer. Now this will distribute traffic between the two control plane servers in either availability zone. We can use route 53 to create a CNAME record of your API server subdomain like say k3s.aws.homecube.io 
pointing to this load balancer. Route 53 is AWS's own DNS service. We'll be connecting to our cluster via this subdomain. Then we also need to create a security group and add rules to allow traffic into the VPC, like port 22 for SSH access to the nodes. The control plane will also be accessible on port 6443, so we allow incoming traffic to that port as well. The control plane nodes also run an etcd cluster, so communication needs to be possible between nodes on the etcd ports of 2379 and 2380. Then optionally, we might need to access some AWS services from within the cluster. For example, if we need some applications to access S3 storage, or if we want pods in the cluster to pull images from the Elastic Container Registry. For this, we create an IAM role and assign it to the nodes in the cluster. Now, IAM, or AWS Identity and Access Management, is a service that helps you securely control access to AWS services. In this tutorial, we will use IAM to enable Session Manager on each node in the cluster. AWS has a service called Systems Manager Session Manager. This service enables you to manage your EC2 instances in a variety of ways, including logging into your servers without SSH. So to do this, we simply create a policy with the required permissions. In this case, Amazon SSM Managed Instance Core. We attach the policy to an IAM role, the role to an instance profile, and the instance profile to the nodes in the cluster. So now we know all the components we need to deploy, let us create a new Terraform project and start defining all of our AWS resources. The very first thing we do is make sure we have the AWS provider plugin installed and we can do that by defining it in a provider.tf file. We can also use the required providers block to specify a version of the plugin. We will also need the random provider plugin to generate some random strings. We will use these strings later when we define the EC2 instances. And now to make sure all plugins are installed and that our project is initialized, we run Terraform init. So from the very beginning, if we want our Terraform project to be flexible and reusable, we can define some variable information in a variables.tf file. Like the project name, the region, availability zones, how many nodes we want to deploy, or what IP address ranges we will use for each subnet. This can all be set each time we use the project to deploy a new cluster. We can also define default values that are used if no values are changed. And if we want to set different values, we define them in a terraform.auto.tfvars file like this. Now these values will automatically be loaded into the Terraform project. So now we can define the VPC and other network AWS components in a VPC file. We assign a name and an IP address range to the VPC. The VPC name is simply a combination of the project name followed by the word VPC. So whatever is set in the project name variable will be used here as well. The AWS subnet section will create two public subnets in the main VPC since our default node count is set to two. Each subnet will have its own IP address range and its own availability zone. We also need to create the same number of route tables, so one route table per subnet, and then associate each route table to its corresponding subnet. Each route table should have a default route pointing to an internet gateway for internet access. And then lastly comes the internet gateway definition. So next up, we define EC2 resources in an EC2 file. And the very first resource is of course the AWS instance. So we set the node count, the ID of the Amazon Linux image to use on the servers and the type or size of server to deploy. Each server will be deployed in its own availability zone and we do that by setting a subnet for each server. So the node with count zero will be added to the subnet with count zero and the node with count one to the subnet with count one and so on and so forth depending on how many nodes you have in your project. And then for SSH access, you can pre-create a key pair in the AWS console. You can do this in the EC2 service under network and security. And then you can set the name of the key pair under key name. Now, before we can set the IAM instance profile, we need to define it as well. So let us create an IAM file where we can define all of our IAM resources. 
So we can start off by defining an AWS IAM role resource. So in order to define who is able to assume this role, we add a policy document under assume role policy. In the policy document, we are allowing the EC2 service or EC2 instances to be able to assume this role. We also need the role to be able to use session manager. So we add an inbuilt AWS policy of Amazon SSM managed instance core. Then finally, we create an instance profile and attach the role we just defined. Now we can use the instance profile in the AWS instance back in the EC2 file. Now we also need to create a security group to attach to each node. And we can first define it in this AWS security group block below. We set the VPC the security group belongs to and some metadata like the name, the description and some tags. And then we can add rules to allow inbound traffic to ports 22, 6443, 2379 and 2380. And a rule also to allow all outgoing traffic. Now we can add the security group to security groups in the AWS instance resource. For SSH access, we can assign a public IP address to each node. Now, in order for the nodes to form a cluster, we need to make sure we set a static private IP address to at least one of the nodes or the first node in the cluster. So this is what we are doing with this conditional statement and a private IP. If the index of the node is zero or the first node that is being deployed, then set a specific IP address. If not, set the private IP to null, which means do not set this value at all. So for the actual IP address, we are going to be obtaining it from the first subnet defined in the variables file under CIDR blocks. And here we are simply replacing the last part of it with 100. So the first node will have an IP address ending in 100. Now, this is important for the cluster formation, and you can see why when we examine the install script. This is a bash script that we'll use to install K3S Kubernetes on the EC2 instances. So the first statement checks if the node being installed is the first node in the group. If it is, then it will go ahead and run this call command, which downloads and installs a K3S Kubernetes distribution. You can of course refer to the official K3S documentation for more install options to further customize your Kubernetes installation. An important configuration we need to take note of here is the TLS Sun option. Now this configures an extra subdomain as an alternative domain name for the Kube API server's TLS certificate. This will add a custom domain to the TLS certificate on which you can access the cluster. The second part of the bash script runs on the second node. It checks the first node in a loop to see if the API server is running. And if it is running, that means that the etcd server is also running. So if etcd is up, that means it is safe to start its own K3S installation and connect to the first node to form a cluster. So in order to run this script in the EC2 instance, once it starts, we define it under user data. So we also set the count index variable used inside the script to the count.index of the AWS instance resource. And finally, we can set the size of the disk and the name of the instance. The instance name is a string including the project name, the word k8 node, and a randomly generated string at the end. This string is generated in this random string block. So after the VPC and the EC2 instances, we can define the network load balancer. We first create a target group in the main VPC. The TCP port 6443 should be accessible on the targets. Then we add both EC2 instances as targets to the target group with the AWS LB target group attachment block. The AWS LB block defines an external network load balancer. We also need to define the security groups that control traffic flowing through the load balancer and the subnets where it will operate. Then finally, we create a listener for the load balancer. This ensures it listens on TCP port 6443 and forwards that traffic to the target group defined above. So in order to handle DNS or to have our cluster accessible via DNS domain name, you can create a Route 53 hosted zone for a subdomain in a Route 53 file. 
of course you need to make sure you own this subdomain once you create the hosted zone you also need to add the txt records in your domain registrar's portal this will complete the registration of the subdomain with route 53 then we can create a CNAME record which will point the cluster's subdomain to the load balancer. So now we have defined all the resources we need to deploy our new cluster. We can now run Terraform plan to do a final check. A Terraform apply will go ahead and deploy this infrastructure to your AWS account. So give the deployment some time to complete. And then head over to the AWS console and verify that everything deployed successfully. You can now check the EC2 instances, the security groups, the network load balancer, the CNAME records in Route 53. Let us log in to an EC2 instance with Session Manager and run a few commands. You can see that K3S is running on the first node, which means it is deployed successfully to the first node. A kubectl get nodes shows that we have two nodes in the cluster. So this means that the second node also installed successfully. So the cluster is now deployed and running in the cloud. We can configure a new context so that we can also access this cluster locally. To do this, we can retrieve the kube config from any control plane node. You should be able to find this at this path on the node. You can edit it by changing the cluster's server address to the subdomain we created in fraud 53. Create a new context to this file and then try and access the cluster. You should be able to run a few kubectl commands now and verify that everything is running. And that should be it. You should now have a running self-managed cluster running in AWS. Now, these same concepts can be used to deploy a cluster of any Kubernetes distribution. I will link the GitHub project in the description, including a readme file with all the steps that we did in this video, so that you can reproduce this later in your own AWS account. Remember to delete all the resources you created once you are done testing to avoid incurring any further AWS charges. A Terraform destroy should be able to help you delete all the resources that you created. And once again, thanks for watching. Make sure you get subscribed for more and I'll see you in the next one.